The nature of thought. The nature of thought may be studied from two standpoints, from the side of consciousness, which is knowledge, or from the side of the form by which knowledge is obtained, the susceptibility of which two modifications makes possible the attainment of knowledge. This possibility has led to the two extremes in philosophy, both of which we must avoid because each ignores one side of manifested life. One regards everything as consciousness, ignoring the essentiality of form as conditioning consciousness, as making it possible. The other regards everything as form, ignoring the fact that form can only exist by virtue of the life and soul in it. The form and the life, the matter and the spirit, the vehicle and the consciousness are inseparable in manifestation and are the indivisible aspect of that in which both in air. That which is neither consciousness nor is vehicle, but the root of both. A philosophy which tries to explain everything by the forms, ignoring the life, will find problems it is utterly unable to solve. A philosophy which tries to explain everything by the life, ignoring the forms, will find itself faced by that was which it cannot surmount. The final word on this is that consciousness and its vehicles, life and form, spirit and matter, are the temporary expressions of the two aspects of the one conditional existence, which is not known save when manifested as the root spirit. The abstract being, the abstract logos, whence all individual selves and the root matter, whence all forms. Whenever manifestation takes place, this root spirit gives birth to a tri triple consciousness and this root matter to a triple matter. Beneath this is the one reality, forever incognizable by the conditioned consciousness. The flower sees not the root when it grows, though all its life is drawn from it and without it it could not be. The self, as nowhere, as its characteristic function, the, mi the mirroring within itself of the not-self. As a sensitive plate receives rays of light reflected, reflected from objects, and those rays cause modifications in the material on which they fall, so that images of the objects can be obtained. So it is with the self in the aspect of knowledge towards everything external. His vehicle is a sphere where on the self receives from the not-self the reflected rays of the oneself, causing to appear on the surface of the sphere images which are the reflection of that which is not in self. The knower does not know the things themselves in the earlier stages of his consciousness. He knows only the images produced in his vehicle by the action of the not-self on his responsive casing, the photographs of the external world. Hence the mind, the vehicle of the self as nowhere, has been compared to a mirror in which are seen the images of all objects before it. We do not know the things themselves, but only the effect produced by them in our consciousness. Not the objects, but the images of the objects are what we find in the mind. As the mirror seems to have the objects within it, but those apparent objects are only images, illusions caused by the rays of light reflected from the objects, not the object themselves, so does the mind, in its knowledge of the outer universe, not only the elusive images and other things in themselves. These images, made in the vehicle, are perceived as object by the knower, and this perception consists in his reproduction of them in himself. Now, the analogy of the mirror and the use of the word the reflection in the preceding paragraph are a little misleading, for the mental image is a reproduction, not a reflection, of the object 
which causes it. The matter of the mind is actually shaped into a likeness of the object presented to it, and this likeness in its turn is reproduced by the knower. When it thus modifies itself into the likeness of an external object, it is said to know that object, but in the case we are considering that which it knows is only the image produced by the object in its vehicle, and not the object itself. And this, this image is not a perfect reproduction of the object, for a reason we shall see in the next chapter. But it may be said, will that be so ever? Shall we never know the things in themselves? This brings us to vital distinction between the consciousness and the matter in which the consciousness is working, and by this we may find an answer to the natural question of the human mind. When the consciousness, by long evolution, has developed the power to reproduce within itself all that exists outside it, then the envelope of matter in which it has been working falls away. Oh, then the envelope of matter in which it has been working falls away, and the consciousness that is knowledge identifies itself with all the selves amid which it has been evolving, and sees at the not-self only the matter connected alike with all selves severally. That is the they be with us, the union which is the triumph of evolution. When consciousness knows itself and others, and knows others as itself, by sameness of nature, perfect knowledge is attained and the self realizes that marvelous state where identity perishes not, ah, perishes not, and memory is not lost, but where separation finds its ending and nowhere knowing and knowledge are one. It is in this wondrous nature of the self, who is evolving in us through knowledge at the present time, that we have to study in order to understand the nature of thought, and it is necessary to see clearly the illusory side in order that we may utilize the illusion to transcend it. So let us now study how knowing the relation between the knower and the known is established, and this will lead us to see more clearly into the nature of thought. The chain of knower, knowing and known. There is one word, vibration, which is becoming more and more the keynote, keynote of Western science as it has long been that of the science of the East. Motion is the root of all. Life is motion. Consciousness is motion. And that motion affecting manner, matter, is vibration. The one, the all, we think of as changeless, either as absolute motion or as motionless, since in one relative motion cannot be. Only when there is the differentiation, <laughs> or parts, can we think of what we call motion, which is change of place in succession of time. When the one becomes the many, then motion arises. It is health, consciousness, life, when rhythmic, regular, as it is disease, unconsciousness, death, when without rhythm, irregular. For life and death are twin sisters, alike born of motion, which is manifestation. Motion must needs appear when the one becomes the many, since when the omnipresent appears as separate particles, infinite motion must represent omnipresence, or otherwise put, must be its reflection or image in matter. The essence of matter is separateness, as that of spirit is unity, and when the twain appear in the one, a screaming milk, the reflection of the only presence of that one in the multiplicity of matter is ceaseless and infinite motion. Absolute motion, the presence of every moving unit at every point of space at every moment of time, is identical with rest, being only rest looked at in another way, from the standpoint of matter instead of that of spirit. From the standpoint of spirit, there is always one, 
from that of matter, there are always many. This infinite motion appears as rhythmical movements, vibrations in the matter which manifest it, each jiva or separate unit of consciousness being isolated by an enclosing wall of matter from all other jivas. There is no convenient English word for a separate unit of consciousness, spirit and soul, connoting various peculiarities in different schools of thought. Should therefore venture to use the name jiva instead of the clumsy a separate unit of consciousness. Each jiva <laughs> further becomes embodied or clothed in several garments of matter. As these garments of matter vibrate, they communicate their vibrations to the matter surrounding them. Such matter becomes in the medium wherein the vibrations are carried outwards, and this medium in turn communicates the impulse of vibration to the enclosing garments of another jiva and two sets the jiva vibrating like the first. In this series of vibrations, beginning in one jiva, made in the body that encircles it, sent on by the body to the medium around it, communicated by that to another body, and from that second body to the jiva, encircled by it, we have the chain of vibrations whereby one knows the other. The second knows the first because it reproduces the first in itself, and those experiences as the experiences, and yet with a difference, for our second jiva is already in a vibratory condition, and his state of motion after receiving the impulse from the first is not a simple repetition of that impulse, but a combination of his own original motion with that imposed on him from without, and hence is not a perfect reproduction. Similarities are obtained ever closer and closer, but identity ever eludes, eludes us, so long as the garments remain. This sequence of vibra vibratory actions is often seen in nature. A flame is a center of vibratory activity in ether, named by us it. These vibrations or it waves through the surrounding ether in a piece of iron lying near into similar waves and its particles vibrate under their impulse, and so the iron becomes hot and a source of it in its turn. So does a series of vibrations pass from one jiva to another, and all beings are interlinked by this network of consciousness. So again, in physical nature, we mark off different ranges of vibrations by different names. Calling one satellite, another it, another electricity, another sound, and so on, yet all are of the same nature, all are modes of motion in ether. Sound is also primarily an etheric vibration, uh, though they differ in rates of velocity and in the character of the weights, thoughts, desires, and actions, the active manifestation in matter of knowledge, will, and energy, are all of the same nature, that is, are all made up of vibration, but differ in their phenomena because of the different character of the vibration. There is a series of vibrations in a particular kind of matter, and with a certain character, and this we call taupe vibrations, another series is spoken of as desire vibrations, another series as action vibrations. These names are descriptive of certain facts in nature, there is a certain kind of ether thrown into vibration, and its vibrations affect our eyes. We call the motion light. There is another far subtler, subtler ether thrown into vibration, which are perceived and resp are responded to by the mind, and we call that motion thought. We are surrounded by matter of different densities, and we name and we name the motions in it as they affect ourselves, are answered to by different organs of our gross subtle bodies. We name light certain motions affecting the eye. We name thought certain motions affecting another organ, the mind. Seeing occurs when the light ether is thrown into waves from an object to our eye. Thinking occurs when the thought ether is thrown into waves between an object and our mind. The one is not more nor less mysterious than the other. In dealing with the mind, we shall see that modifications in the arrangement of its materials 
are caused by the impact of tow waves and that in concrete thinking we experience over again the original impact from without. The knower finds his activity in these vibrations and all to which they can answer that is all they, that they can reproduce is knowledge. The thought is a reproduction within the mind of the knower of that which is not the knower, is not the self. It is a picture caused by a combination of wave motions and image, quite literally. A part of the not-self vibrates, and as the knower vibrates in answer, that part becomes the known. The matter quivering between them makes knowing possible by putting them into touch with each other. Thus is the chain of knower, known and knowing established and maintained.